Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're going to get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Jeremy Bassett is the pastor at Wesley United Methodist Church. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Shadid if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everyone please stand at this time? As we focus our thoughts on prayer, just these words. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Let us pray. Dear God of all of us, we are deeply grateful for our life together in this community of Oklahoma City. We give you thanks for so many faithful and diligent public servants who work every day to make our lives better, stronger, safer, dealing each day with innumerable challenges and obstacles to keep our city going. So much that happens every day in the city goes unnoticed and often unrewarded, yet only happens because someone has been willing to do their job in ensuring this community functions. For each and every one, we give you thanks. For tasks faithfully done, for each person honoring you and their diligence of their work, done to the best of their ability, we give you thanks. And for the work that lies ahead today for this council, we pray. Choices need to be weighed, information interpreted, priorities properly understood, budgets carefully managed, and competing interests reconciled. And so, O oh God, we pray for your wisdom, for grace and patience to work together on behalf of all of those who live and work in our city. May the actions of this council today give voice to the unheard, strength to the weak, hope to the weary and struggling, and encouragement to all so that it results in more and more of us being willing to participate with these servants and officers of our city in building a community that reflects the values and life of your kingdom. It is in your strong and holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You know, one of the areas of city government that we have improved on a great deal is our animal welfare department. We have seen our, our production numbers go uh, way down and with public-private partnerships, the Humane Society and other relationships, the general public has come to take, help us take ownership over this issue and we are coming very, very close to someday becoming a no-kill city. And we were one of the worst examples in the country 15 years ago. So I think all of us in this era of Oklahoma City's progress should feel good about how far we've come. And we have another partnership to announce today that I think is, is significant, and uh, it's been going on for a while. Um, but it's an example of how Oklahoma City can get behind a project that, that uh, tugs at our hearts, but we all realize has to be done. And that is a, a citation for the Shawnee Milling Company. I'm going to ask Joe Ford to come on up. Um, you know, in a, in a business perspective, you have your fixed cost. And one thing, when you run an animal shelter, you've got to feed the animals. Well, Joe is with Shawnee Milling Company, and they're making a large donation once again to our animal welfare department to help us feed our animals. So that's a direct savings to the citizens, and we have a citation. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas Shawnee Milling Company has been a fixture in Oklahoma since its opening in 1906. Whereas, as a founding member of the Made in Oklahoma Coalition, Shawnee Milling has partnered with other Oklahoma food manufacturers for many years to fill the shelves of food banks across Oklahoma to help those in need. Whereas, besides the many Shawnee Mills products we serve to our families each day, the company also produces some of the finest animal feed and pet foods. In 2015, Shawnee Milling pledged a donation to the City of Oklahoma City's Animal Shelter of 100 tons of pet food over a two-year period. 
This donation provides the shelter animals with a high quality, consistent diet, which results in healthier, happier, adoptable animals. Whereas since September 2015, this donation has benefited over 30,000 cats and dogs in the shelter's care. The City of Oklahoma City animal welfare staff and shelter patrons and volunteers are so very appreciative of this donation that is truly life-changing for those homeless animals. Let's now, hear it for Shawnee Milling Company. Did I, did I cut you off there? Sorry. Thank you very much. Well, I, I sure appreciate this citation, but we're really happy with the partnership we have with the Oklahoma City Animal Shelter. We were connected by the Oklahoma Humane Society to let us know of the need, and we're just extremely excited the progress they've made, as you mentioned, towards the no-kill facility. 270 employees and expanding your business, so congratulations on that side of it, too. Thank you very much. Right. Let's show our appreciation. Your Honor, if yes. I may, before we move on to the next one, again, just want to uh, emphasize the benefit that Mr. Ford and his family and the company has provided to the uh, animals out there. Without their assistance, uh, we are relying upon uh, individual donations, and there's no consistency in the food, and it, it really does have an impact on the animals. So uh, we, we truly, each one of us from the council, do uh, appreciate all the work uh, Mr. Ford has done, and we look forward to a long and happy relationship with Shawnee Milling. Thank you. It's a great gift for us, yes. All right, it's Park and Recreation Month, and we have some of our um, most outstanding civic volunteers who help lead some of our uh, park commissions and different types of activities that we have. So, gentlemen, all come up. Doug Cupper is here with Alan Payne, Hal McKnight, Gary Mars, Elliot Yaffe, and Rick Godfrey. We have a proclamation about Parks and Recreation Month, and I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas July is National Park and Recreation Month, and parks and recreation programs are a vital part of communities across America, including Oklahoma City. The Oklahoma City Parks and Recreation Department provides green spaces and dynamic facilities and programs so citizens can obtain a high quality of life, contributing to the overall well-being of the community, its economy, and culture. Whereas parks and recreation programs provide recreational exercise and wellness opportunities to aid citizens with disease prevention by encouraging healthy habits and exercise, improving their overall health. Whereas parks and recreation programs contribute to economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, attraction, and retention of businesses and employees, and in crime reduction. Whereas parks and recreation lands improved air and water quality, protect groundwater, provide vegetative buffers, and produce sustainable habitat for wildlife. Whereas our parks and recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community, allowing children and adults to connect with nature through primitive and manicured landscapes. Whereas Oklahoma City recognizes the invaluable contributions of Parks and Recreation Department employees and volunteers who help people relax, connect with others, and enjoy the many benefits of Parks and Recreation programs and facilities. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim the month of July as Park and Recreation Month in Oklahoma City. Let's show our appreciation for our Parks and Recreation Department. Doug, you couldn't do it without these community volunteers. That's correct, uh, Your Honor. Uh, these are the unsung heroes that, that stand behind us in providing for quality parks and recreational activities. Uh, we're one of the few municipal municipalities that have their own Game and Fish Commission, their own uh, River Trust that, that guides us in creating new activities on our river, and, and of course, our Golf Commission uh, helps manage low-cost golf for our citizens. But again, uh, Hal McKnight uh, is guiding us through the trails and the pathways that, that we create for the citizens for a healthier tomorrow. And of course, Alan Payne, our, our uh, chairman of the Board of Park Commissioners, he, is the, uh, he helps guide and oversee land uses and our policies and procedures. So we couldn't do what we do for the citizens without these gentlemen uh, backing us up as unsung heroes for the city of Oklahoma City. So again, thank you, Mayor and Council, for couldn't, couldn't have said it better. But let's talk about some of the programming you got going on. There may be people out there who don't realize all of the programming that's going on in the parks and stuff. 
I appreciate that. Uh, we uh, obviously this is our time of year for athletic activities. We've got t-ball going on, youth baseball. We just ended our soccer season. Uh, we'll be going into uh, the fall season later on this summer. But at our rec centers, we have a lot of new dynamic programming going on out there uh, that we are creating a safe environment for our kids during summer break. So I encourage you parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts, check out uh, our uh, uh, guide that's online right now with all the programs that are offered. Uh, we also are partnering with the STEAM program, so we're, we're getting science and education and and all of that uh, through the summer because we know keeping kids interested in education will help them uh, further and start better in their next grades higher. And of course, out at Martin Park, we got a lot of dynamic outdoor programs going on out there as well. So uh, a lot of great things going on. And, and uh, one of the things that, that we haven't brought forward yet, but we have just gotten word from the Oklahoma Soccer Association that the Oklahoma City Parks and Recreation Department will be afforded a membership as a club member in the Oklahoma Soccer Association for the work that we do out at Wendell Wisenhunt Sports Complex. So, so we will be able to provide the inner city kids the opportunity that, that some of our urban partners get to uh, participate in. They'll be able to go to tournaments and things. So we're real excited about that. That's great. Thank you. Let's show our appreciation to everything our parks department does. And it is Home Ownership Month. I think we have some people here from the Department of Housing and Urban Development that have come over to remind us. And one of the messages today, you know, we all know what home ownership is, but one of the messages is financial literacy and the, and the need of providing financial literacy to people who might be in the market of a home, what responsibilities they take on. We have a proclamation that will introduce that item, and then we'll hear more about that. <clears throat> Whereas the city of Oklahoma City recognizes that home ownership instills a greater sense of community pride, enhances public safety, builds personal financial security, and stabilizes neighborhoods. Whereas each year, National Home Ownership Month is celebrated in the United States to promote the benefits of owning and investing in a home. Everyone needs a place to call home, make memories, and build better lives. Whereas the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Oklahoma City Field Office of HUD have made great strides in providing funds and guidance to cities throughout the state of Oklahoma, thus giving many more Americans an equal opportunity to live where they choose. Whereas the city of Oklahoma City invites and welcomes all prospective home buyers to purchase a home in Oklahoma City, regardless of their race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, sexual orientation, or disability. Whereas the Oklahoma City's Housing and Community Development Division of the Planning Department and local nonprofit partners value home ownership by investing in home buyer education, foreclosure prevention, down payment assistance, housing rehab, weatherization, energy efficiency, handicap accessibility, affordable housing construction, and fair housing programs. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim the month of June as Home Ownership Month in Oklahoma City. Let's show our appreciation to the <laughs> Department of Housing and Urban Development and all they do. And I, uh, you know, I guess I knew individually you did all these things, but these are valuable services. Um, uh, home buyer education, foreclosure prevention, down payment assistance, housing rehabilitation, weatherization, energy efficiency, handicap accessibility, affordable housing construction, and fair housing programs. Those are all necessary to having a, a nice community. So thank you for what you're doing. And what can we do to encourage financial literacy in this area? Well, I think continuing on with the great work that the city of Oklahoma City has been doing is, is the first thing there. Uh, making, recognizing June as Home Ownership Month is important just to refocus our attention that uh, it's not HUD's only mission, but it's certainly a very important mission to provide through FHA uh, insurance and all the other things that were mentioned there to make home ownership a, a, a viable dream for hardworking families uh, and, as you say, to make it not just getting the keys to the house, but being able to one year and two years and later down the line to be able to sustain that, that, uh, that home ownership opportunity. 
And uh, so we thank you very much, Mayor and Council Members, for, for this honor, or for the proclamation. And our HUD Director, our, our uh, Regional Administrator, Beth Van Dyne, who uh, is on her way here today and hopes to move forward to meeting with you perhaps later on, uh, on behalf of she and uh, uh, Sharon Gordon Barbero, the field office director in Oklahoma City, we very much appreciate this uh, proclamation and look forward to continuing a very good partnership with the city. Thank you very much. We look forward to it too. Let's show our appreciation to HUD. All right, we're on item three of the council agenda, series of appointments. I'll look for a motion. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item four is the journal of council proceedings. 4A is to receive the journal for June 13th. 4B is to approve the journal for both May 30th and June 6th. Comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item five is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, none other than the two that are listed on the agenda this morning. Item 9D and item 9E. All right. Any other requests? Move on to item 6. This is revocable permits. The first is a, an effort from the Oklahoma City Riverfront Redevelopment Authority and the OKCX Cycle Club in hosting the Oklahoma River Trail Relay. This would be August 13th. Is there anyone here representing this event? Come on forward. Good morning. We'll need your morning. name and address. Uh, for the my record. name's David Rudkin, 1025 Cambridge Court. I actually live in Moore, Oklahoma, but the, the uh, OKCX Cycle Club is based out of Celestial Cycles up on Hefner Road. And uh, we've partnered with the City of Oklahoma City and uh, the Riverfront uh, Redevelopment Authority to have an event using the river trail system all the way from Overholzer uh, basically down to the boathouse and back. And half of those proceeds will go to the River uh, the Redevelopment Authority as well as the OKCX Cycling Club. Wonderful. And yeah, th those are like a long race. You're going through wards one, three, six, and seven. Uh, yeah, it's basically a relay race. It's a 13.4 mile bike and a 5K run. All right. Is there a motion? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Item 6A2 is a revocable permit with that same organization, but it's a companion item. So we'll just need a motion to confirm it. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Then item 6B is a request from Prodigal to hold the 2017 Downtown Fourth Fest. And Billy Walton is here. Good morning, Billy. Good morning. We'll need your name and address for the record. Uh, Billy Walton, 615 North Hudson. All right. I I'm guess... here with uh, Prodigal on behalf of Downtown Fourth Fest. Uh, this is our fifth time to produce this event. Uh, it's kind of been an ever-changing, evolving event as the progress of Oklahoma City has change things for us in a good way though. Um, this is a, uh, what we're doing this year is going to be down in the river parks, uh, down at the uh, River Sport Adventures with a partnership with the Boathouse uh, Foundation. Uh, we'll have a backyard kind of atmosphere with it with tents and food trucks and backyard games uh, all out uh, in front of the Devon Boathouse. And then also with that partnership with the uh, Boathouse Foundation, there will be uh, their full programming and that, that they will actually extend on into the night uh, to where people can watch fireworks on kayaks and pontoon boats and actually in the, uh, the uh, river sport uh, rapids as well. Uh, of course, the main event will be the fireworks show that we'll produce. Uh, we have a new location for that this year. It'll be just south uh, west of the, Oklahoma, or the, the river right to the west of Lincoln. Uh, it's going to be a large, large show, so it actually should be able to be enjoyed by numerous, uh, numerous of the uh, locations around downtown Oklahoma City. Okay. And so this is actually on the 4th, because I know so many 4th yes, of it'll, July it'll on celebrations July this year yes. are moving to the 3rd because of it's, because it's a Tuesday. It'll be on the 4th. And what time should people start showing up? Or is it? Uh, we'll start all of our programming at about 4 o'clock, and that'll be uh, with the River Sports as well. Uh, but this will uh, extend on until the fireworks show at about 9.45 is when the show will kick off. And that'll be about a 15-minute show. And then uh, people are welcome to hang around and 
this will probably end up around 1130. All right. Well, everybody should enjoy the river at least once Definitely. every summer. So yes. go down July 4th and be a part of Prodigal's 2017 Downtown Fourth Fest. Thanks for coming down and letting us know. Thank you. Is there a motion? It's in Ward 7, John. Second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Billy. Well, we're the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are six items here. All right, we have a motion and a second on the MFA. Any comments or questions? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the PPA? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. All right, we have a motion and a second. Comments or questions on the EAT? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. Are to All right, are there any individual considerations? Mayor, I had a couple of things. Okay. Um, 7T, uh, 7V, uh, 7X, 7Y and 7Z2. Uh, that was a lot. You're long-winded today, Meg. <laughs> All right, item T. Let's see if I can get there. I'm making up for lost time. I wasn't here last week, so I or two weeks ago, so I need to cover as many as I can. I just wanted to uh, recognize the uh, Tour de Beer um, who have made an $11,000 contribution to our animal welfare division. And we had an opportunity to thank Purina earlier today and this isn't just another uh, example of uh, support that we received from the community to help our animal welfare division. Um, moving on to uh, 7V. Um, this is our um, second time to send out a request for proposals for the Old City Jail, which is located at 200 North Chartel. I just wanted to bring attention to that, um, see if we might get some interesting um, possibilities um, received by the office. And I, I did um, just want to ask the question, I visited a little bit with the manager about it, whether or not this location might be a possibility for our Family Justice Center. We are in the process of looking for a location near to the downtown police campus and the yes more permanent more permanent location Palomar. for the Palomar Center and it may not be practical but while we're looking for uses mm -hmm. I just wanted to throw that in the mix as a possibility okay so just a thought um, 7x and I see a number of our friends here from the Kiwanis uh, Club Steve Slauson and a number of his group. Would you all stand up if you've been working on this project? Uh, Asa Highsmith, uh, who's our new Ward 6 Planning Commissioner, has been doing the architectural work. And um, the Kiwanis um, are uh, working on a, have been for many, many years, an early childhood center um, associated originally with uh, Mark Twain Elementary School. It goes back for many, many years that their club has supported this. And with our help um, through a community development block grant, uh, community development block grant funds, they will be building a brand new facility. Um, and the other partners involved in this are um, the Inasmuch Foundation, Sarkis Foundation, Miners Foundation, Gaylord Foundation, the David McLaughlin Trust. It's about a $2 million project to help support children from birth through kindergarten. And so I wanted to recognize uh, that their hard work in this project. Um, Seven or Y is um, a grant um, for our uh, moving ahead for progress in the 21st century grant, um, which will um, help uh, provide alternative uh, transportation projects and authorizing um, some matching funds on North 13th Street and Sheridan um, through this MAP 21 project. And finally, uh, 7ZZ um, is the award of the contract. I think we mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, that this is the award of the contract for the streetscape project 
um, on Western Avenue between 18th and 23rd Street. So we're very happy to finally get that underway. Sorry. It's all right. There is. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And that moves us to the concurrence docket. That moves those All right, are there any individual considerations? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And we're on to item nine. These are items that require a separate vote. We'll start with a series of zoning cases. The first is an ABC issue in Ward 3. The address is 12320 Northwest 10th Street. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Is the applicant present? If you would give the council just a very brief overview of what you've got in mind here. Absolutely, Your Honor. I'm Ellen Sparopoulos, 3200 Northwest 20th Street, Oklahoma City and I'm counsel for the applicant HOA restaurant holder. This is out at Check Hall Crossing at the Oklahoma City Yukon line. It's part of a large commercial development. This will be one of the many restaurants that will be out there. This will be a Hooters. And so they're seeking ABC2 overlay in order to develop that as a, a Hooters concept restaurant. Thank you, ma'am. If you haven't been out there and seen the development going on at Check Hall and I-40, I'd suggest you do it. It's uh, quite, uh, quite good for Oklahoma City. Uh, there were no protests at the Planning Commission. Uh, nobody has signed up to speak, so I would move for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 9A2 is a zoning case in Ward 1. It's at 11611 Royal Coach Drive. It's currently R4 General Residential and several other zoning classifications, and it would be all put into a new PUD. James? Uh, has anybody signed up? No, sir. No? Okay. Uh, well, this is a, a down zoning from mainly R4 and C3 with a little bit of R1 and AA in it. It's, the base zoning is R2. It allows for uh, duplexes and uh, three or four family homes, but I think for the plan is actually it's all duplexes. So I think this is good for the um, long term of this area because it's getting rid of the R4 and the C3 in the middle of a, of a uh, mainly R1 area, so um, if nobody else has signed up, I'll move for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A2. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A3 is also in Ward 1. The address is 10004 Northwest 50th. It's currently AA Agricultural, and it would be put into a new PUD if approved. James? Is uh, anybody signed up for this one? No. Okay. Uh, this one's a little bit more complicated than the last one, so I'll let uh, Eric Groves kind of explain the basics of it. Thank you, Council and Mayor, members of the Council. I'm Eric Groves. I'm attorney for the applicant, Ken McGee. A little bit of background on this. Um, if you look uh, on the screen, you'll see that to the immediate south of the subject property is PUD 813. <clears throat> Back in 2002, Dennis Box and I negotiated that PUD and it has been in place ever since. It is not built out. Uh, it is owned by my client. Uh, Mr. McGee has decided to, in effect, extend that PUD to the north. So if you see the subject property, uh, you'll see that there's a road that will come off of Route 66, go through PUD 813, and access the new PUD. Uh, PUD 813 is scheduled for a mixed-use development. It will be involve commercial and some offices. My client will build his new office there. Uh, the subject property will be much of the same thing. Uh, we will not need access to Northwest 50th Street. All access will be from that main road that goes down to 66. <clears throat> it's interesting to observe that this, uh, uh, these two PUDs, which will be developed together, are situated a little bit to the west of Bethany and a little bit to the east of Yukon. And it will provide a shopping opportunity for people who travel uh, on the Kilpatrick or who travel on Route 66. Um, so uh, there was one thing about this that the councilman referred to. When we filed this PUD, staff uh, suggested that we would need to amend the comprehensive plan uh, in order to see it through. Uh, the comprehensive plan, our new plan, uh, put a land use typology of agricultural preserve on the subject property. Uh, we thought this was ill-advised. 
um, and we moved to amend the plan to change it. Uh, the Planning Commission heard two things. They heard our PUD application and they heard our proposal to amend the plan. The Commission unanimously approved the application to amend the plan and unanimously approved the PUD. So we're here to answer any questions you might have about it. Um, the amendment to the comprehensive plan appears later on your agenda today and uh, uh, you would be receiving the resolution of the Planning Commission amending the plan. Uh, in fact, there may be several of those. Uh, I know, I think David Box has one too. Um, in any event, uh, we think this will be a, a good uh, thing for the city and will capture some tax revenues from folks traveling on that highway that might otherwise go to Bethany or Yukon. So we ask for your approval and my client developer is here should you have questions. And so is our engineer, uh, Jason. Questions? Questions for Eric? No, I, I, I think this is a good development for a lot of the reasons he said. There, this is kind of one of the areas in Ward 1 that I've thought, why is there not development going on in between Yukon and Bethany? Because Yukon and Bethany both use Route 66 a lot more than we do there in, 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 on that section. So um, I think it's a good development, and um, hopefully you get a lot of tenants there. So. As soon as we can get them in, they'll yeah. be there. All right. <laughs> I'll uh, move for approval. Second. All right, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Item 9A4 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 5700 Northwest 130th Street. It's currently in a PUD and it would be going to a new simplified plan unit development if approved. Mark? Yes. Um, this is on final hearing and uh, it's to rezone uh, 5700 Northwest 130th Street. PUD 964 to PUD, this PUD uh, 937. And um, I, I want to tell you that I want to thank. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, the one thing I wanted to say about this uh, ordinance, there was, a, there was no protest. There were the Planning Commission unanimously adopted it. But uh, the important thing I wanted to mention was that. This was a project where uh, Preston HOA was concerned about a development. The developer and the homeowners association came together on several times to come up with a compromise. And I love it when, when HOAs can work with the developer and come up with something that, that makes everybody happy and we move forward. And I want to thank Kelly Work and David Box for all their efforts in, in bringing this about. So I'd move for its approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 9A4. Any comments or questions from anyone? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9A5 is a zoning case in Ward 2 at 1009 Northwest 49th Street. It's currently R1 single family, and it would become a new spud if approved. Ed? Did anybody sign up to speak? No, sir. Well, this, this passed the Planning Commission, and, and there's no protesters, so you Take that for what it's worth. We we heard this before. This was a where Chesapeake came in, tore down a residential house, applied to put a parking lot there. Then it then those plans went away. Chesapeake sold it. Now you have a new developer also wants to put surface parking lot where a house once stood. I voted against it then. I don't see how I could vote for it today, just because I, I think the comprehensive plan uh, advocates for maintaining historical lot and block sizes and reducing the size of private parking lots. And I think there's some risk of uh, this, we've talked about this many times, happening across the street and up and down Western. Good morning, David. Good morning, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the Applicant also with me is Tim Johnson. Um, when we sat out on this, you know, we, we had a lot of history on this site, as you referenced. So one of the first things we advised our client was, we got to go talk to the neighbors. Um, one of the reasons that it failed last time was we didn't have neighborhood support. Um, they were against it. Um, they had a lot of problems with it. And, you know, time has passed. And so we went and sat down with them. Uh, th there was some initial frustration and anger. I think once they realized that my clients were not Chesapeake and were local developers, um, you know, they, they bought the entire thing from Chesapeake 
and unfortunately this, this little piece has, has lagged behind it. So what we did was we set out to try to show them, you tell us how you want this to look. Um, obviously the person most impacted is this residence immediately to the east. And so what we showed her was a couple options of where to put the fence. And ultimately what she chose was she wanted the fence and it'll be an eight foot solid masonry wall. She wanted the fence closer to the, the actual end of pavement so that we could landscape essentially what will look as if it were her yard. One of her biggest concerns was uh, a, a large tree right here. So you can see there's a little bump out of, uh, of our wall that will allow for the retention of that tree. Uh, additionally, we have included a, a space for some public art. But one of the concerns the neighbors had was, you know, we've got hideaway going in here, you know, a potential uh, restaurant or retail here, and an office building here. The neighbors certainly want this to be successful. They're very excited about hideaway, but one of the things they want to make sure is that their homes are not flooded with cars in front of their houses. And so what this allows us to do is to bring the cars into the parking. Again, my clients weren't involved in the teardown. They, um, had, had we started over, they wouldn't have done that. Um, but we are where we are, and I think the neighbors finally acknowledged that. But when we had the, you know, the staff recommend approval, in part because it's conforming with the comprehensive plan, um, all the neighbors signed off on it. Planning Commission was unanimous in their approval. Uh, your commissioner, Ms. Powers, was heavily involved in the meetings. She made the motion to approve it. Um, I'm not sure what legal basis would exist to deny this. Um, again, this is, at this point, the will of the neighbors. Um, Planning Commission was unanimous. Uh, we think it's a, an opportunity to perhaps solve a, an otherwise problem that will continue to exist uh, and help the neighbors and help the overall development with parking. I, I do commend you for reaching out to the neighbors. I mean, I've talked to them as well. It sounds like they are not happy, but not going to protest either. I mean, the same, the same objections. I mean, look, look at it, David. It's, it's ugly. It's not, it's, it's a, it's so much surface parking lot. And I, I agree with you. I don't think, I mean, everything you just said is, is fine. But in the future, look how much surface parking lot on such a beautiful, important corner as 50th and Western. I mean, it's just, that's what the comprehensive plan says we should be striving for, is to decrease the parking requirements on, uh, and, and not make this just an asphalt. Yeah. Sure. Now, this, you know, the only piece that we're talking about today is right here. I understand. Uh, and this, we actually baked into the, the PUD the ability to reduce our parking if, you know, we engage in that commercial scheme, and it'll be heavily landscaped. This doesn't reflect all the landscaping that'll actually be here, because that's not what we're talking about. But my client understanding the, you know, the past problem mm -hmm. is doing everything they can to make sure that this is a, a site that is quality and what is becoming a 50th and Western. Um, it heavily, you know, worked with Bishop McGinnis who sent letters of support for not only uh, the hideaway application, but what we're doing here. So they've, again, they, my clients actually are the developers of the Chartel Plaza, uh, just north and east of here. So they've got deep local roots um, and they're doing everything they can to, to get past perhaps some of the errors that were made by the previous landowner. Um, I think they were frankly unaware um, of what those problems were. Uh, Mr. Johnson and I had the opportunity to kind of fill them in and they've done everything in their power as we've moved forward to make sure they can be the new guys that are just trying to right the wrongs of, of what might have happened in the past. I appreciate that. I appreciate <laughs> acknowledging the past. I move for approval. Second. All right, anyone here hoping to speak on this item? All right, cast your votes. Passes 8-1. Thank you. All right, we're on to item 9A6. It's a zoning case in Ward 8 at 4520 Old Farm Road. It's currently a simplified plan unit development, and they would put it into a new SPUD if approved. Mark? Thank you, Your Honor. This is an ordinance on final hearing for SPUD uh, 975. It's to allow an expansion of an existing indoor soccer facility. Uh, it passed unanimously at the Planning Commission, and there are no protesters that I'm aware of, so I'd move for its approval. All right. Anyone here hoping to speak on this item? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 9A7 is a zoning case in Ward 6 at 115 North Tuttle Street. It's currently R1 single family and C1 neighborhood commercial, and it would be put into a new spud. Meg? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is also an ordinance on final hearing. Where there were no protests, the applicant is City Care, and uh, this is an opportunity um, to continue to build out their 
campus, if you will. It adds um, three uh, duplexes um, for uh, mothers with children. Uh, we'll have some commercial mixed use and park space. Is there anybody here that signed up to speak on this? No one has signed up. Seeing no one, uh, I would move approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A7. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9B is an amendment to a master design statement that would eliminate the uh, alcohol permits. This is in Ward 6. Meg, you up to date on this issue? Uh, yes, I am, Mayor. This is uh, in the Plaza District, and we're looking at two things. We're amending the uh, master design statement that eliminates um, drinking establishments, so it, it can be a restaurant that serves alcohol, but it uh, cannot be a bar. Um, and it also then um, recommends approval for the um, SPUD 956. Is anybody here to speak on the item? Sam Gresham, I think, is the developer. Um, this is um, in conformity with um, all everything else that's going on along 16th Street in the Plaza District. I know there was one protest letter, but no protestants at the Planning Commission. It was approved uh, unanimously, and I would move approval. Okay, I'll take that motion on the amendment. We'll be voting twice, oh, it looks okay. like, on this item. So cast your votes on item 9B1. It passes unanimously. And then I, the ordinance on 9B2. Yeah, move approval. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9C would uh, close a fire lane easement in Ward 2. Ed? All right, cast your votes on 9C. It passes unanimously. Item 9D is an ordinance up today that was recommended for denial. It's, it's, it's been this is deferred. It has been, been deferred until July 5th, so two weeks. We'll move on to item 9E. This request has been stricken from the agenda today, is that correct? Oh, I missed one. 9D2 is a sign issue in Ward 3 at 612 North Rockwell. Thank you. Larry, I skipped over you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, would the applicant please come forward? This is an interesting little <clears throat> uh, challenge right here, and so I'd like the applicant to tell the council a little bit of the history and what the final uh, spud would look like. Yeah, D David Box, 522 Colcord Drive here on behalf of the applicants. Uh, they're also with me here this morning. Uh, this is a spud application to allow uh, an EMD sign. Um, it will be an accessory sign. It's not a billboard. Um, when my client went and zoned this property, they agreed to some technical evaluations that they were unaware of uh, the consequences of. So if you look at what I'm handing out now, what we did was take a survey of the area, and what you find is uh, reader board signs for accessory businesses are quite common in the area. Additionally, you'll see signs that uh, greatly exceed what we request, which is 20 feet. Uh, there is an error in the staff report that I need to correct. It says that we are requesting two signs. All, this is just for one sign. Um, so what would, it would allow is to all the uses remain intact, but allow one 20-foot sign um, that would allow an EMB reader board just for the business on this site. Again, it's not a billboard uh, whatsoever. It's just an accessory sign consistent and common with what you see uh, in the exhibits that I've handed out. David, you said they um, were unaware of the TEs. How did that happen? I'm not sure. Uh, but as you may or may not know, every single staff report that goes to Planning Commission, no matter what the request is, has a boilerplate TE that requests the sign to be uh, eight foot tall. Um, and so I, I have found um, several instances over the last several years where uh, applicants might come before the Planning Commission not really understanding. All they see is a recommendation for approval from staff and they don't understand what those evaluations below mean. Um, here it had significant consequences. I've got another one on uh, 240 and Shields where we had a 50-foot sign uh, that they erected because they thought they had the right, but the spud had that, that eight-foot language. And so that, that's what I'm referring to. I don't know that they understood the consequences of, do you agree with staff? Because a lot of times that's the question. Um, well, yeah, we agree with staff because it says recommendation for approval. They may not agree with those comments that are subject to the recommendation, but. That's where the confusion is. So, so they, uh, they do have the capacity to put an eight-foot sign? Uh, an eight-foot sign. And, and that's not? Right, that's not consistent with, with that area. I mean, it, it puts them at a competitive disadvantage um, to most of the other businesses in and around this area.
there any further questions from uh, council? Uh, seeing none, has anybody signed up to protest? Uh, there were no protests sir, at the uh, planning commission meeting. The planning commission did vote for denial, okay, and the staff recommendation had that denial. But in looking at the uh, layout of this area and uh, what the uh, uh, applicant intends to do with it, uh, I'd like to move for approval. So which to, what do I need to do? Uh, just, just make a motion to approve? A motion to approve would be. I'd like correct. to make a motion to approve. Okay. Uh, there needs I, to be I, an I, amendment to the one sign. Because yeah. the original application said two. All right. So take an amendment first. To All right. The, Larry. to go to one sign uh, only, not two. Just okay. the difference between what's in place right now and, and what we're talking about here is 12 foot of signage and, uh, and a little more, little more display area, but it does conform to the EMB3 regulation. Correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So your motion is on the amendment first, I suppose? Yes. Okay. And I heard a second. So cast your votes on the amendment. It passes unanimously. I, I do have one question. Yeah, sure. Where exactly is the sign going to be? Is it for that advantage battery? Yes, sir. Uh, where is it going to be? On, on Rockwell. Yeah, I know, but on which corner? Is it going to be closer to uh, the fire station or? I, I believe it'll be in the grassy area you see where that, that temporary sign is located. Oh, okay. All right, Larry, you make a motion on the ordinance. Your second? Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, item 9E had to do with hotel taxes, and that's been struck from the agenda. Move on to item 9F, and this starts the part of the meeting where we will discuss both the general obligation bond authorization election and the general fund sales tax elections. We're going to start with the GO bond issue on item 9F. And this first resolution would uh, call the special election for September 12th. And the second item would be for the proclamation and the, the actual bond itself. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on the bond issue today? We had the public hearing last time, so it doesn't surprise me that no one is, is here today to speak specifically on those items. Are there comments from council before I look for a motion on 9F? All right, cast your votes. Item 9F passes unanimously. Is there a motion on 9G? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, item 9H is the part of the council meeting where we will discuss the general fund sales tax election. And I think there might be some discussion here. So who wants to get that started from the council perspective? Or do you want to hear from people first? Would that be better? All right, is anyone here today hoping to speak on item 9H? This is the sales tax election that the Council is considering calling for September. All right, looks like it's up to us. Are, are we just discussing the quarter cent, or are we discussing? I think the all issue in general, whatever, whatever you'd like. I think we ought to have just kind of a round of discussion. Let everybody say if they have something to say, and then we'll look for a motion. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm very disappointed, very ashamed of what we're putting forth today. I, I look. I was very excited about this for a long period of time, and I think we're coming up very, very short. Um, I loved the prayer this morning, and I want to find that guy and find that, because he started out with do all the good that you can for as many people as you can. And these decisions to, to distribute this much money is really, it, it, it's not a moral document, but it certainly has a moral component. And doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people, I think, is a consideration. Um, so. At the last minute, we've decided to um, add another quarter penny, $25 million a year, with no public process whatsoever, no public deliberation, uh, by an outside third party. Uh, it didn't come from us, didn't come from the mayor or council, um, and uh, it had no public deliberation uh, at all, and it was done at the last minute. So there are three problems with it, and then one overarching problem. Number one is it's arbitrary. We have had two workshops, and we've had two council meetings, and this is our third. We talked for months about $180 million for streets. Uh, on top of the $150 million in the 2007 bond for streets that have not yet been completed 10 years later, and $500 million for streets uh, in the September election on the bond. So that's $830 million for streets. 
Now we're saying we need another 60 million or $890 million. So to me, that, the, getting the, the, the moral, getting the greatest good for the greatest number of people for that extra 60 million has to be considered with you already having $830 million. So is 60 million more for streets when you already have $830 million more impact on society than for putting that quarter towards schools or transit or parks or take your pick? I mean, I don't think it, I think that the greatest good for the greatest impact on Oklahoma City citizens would be to pick just about anything other than just arbitrarily throwing it into streets. There's no science, there's no data that says another 60 million is going to do this or that. We, we are doing it because an outside third party wants the MAPS tax to stay at 1% for whatever their designs are a couple years from now. But it's about keeping the one cent whole, not any kind of science as to this is how much we need to make an impact on streets. Second thing is it's uncommitted. For decades, the voters on streets have had every street listed on the bond, and they know what the city council is then going to do, and the city council has to execute that plan and do those street projects that the voters voted on, and you can't vary your course. You have some unlisted funds, but the bulk of it is committed. Now you're talking about a $240 million fund, a quarter of a billion dollars that is uncommitted. It's not going to go through the MAPS office like previous MAPS. It's going to just go through public works, I guess, and it, every single developer will be, come, will be pounding on the door of public works to get a piece of that $240 million. I don't understand the process for how that $240 million is going to be decided. Is it going to be per ward? Is it going to be, it's just, it's too uncommitted. I mean, there has to be, this is a, a major policy departure from the way we've done it for decades in this city. And it's just too big of a pot of money that is not committed to specific projects. Third, it's a tax increase. And we, people were adamant in the workshops, adamant that we could not increase the mill uh, levy. Uh, traditionally, streets are handled with property tax. We know that Tulsa is running their mill levy at 24, 24 and we're at 16. They're 50% higher than us. But everyone seemed to have consensus we cannot have a tax increase. And yet, here we are not using a pro an increase in property tax, but increasing sales tax, which we need uh, because of this unique situation that we're in in Oklahoma, where we're dependent on sales tax for operations. So we're increasing our, our sales tax to pay for something that's traditionally been paid for with property tax. I, I can't understand uh, that. But here's the overarching issue, and I, I think that the, the focus of the campaign has now changed for me. For me, it is now a referendum on the process. For the Chamber of Commerce to come in with one week to go, where there's no wiggle room, there's no, you only have a week, and to say, we want uh, this to, to increase by $60 million, we want a $60 million tax increase, and only give us and the public seven days to think about it, and now to vote on it, and we, this, we have to vote on it today, this is the last day we can vote on it. Uh, that seems by design to make it to the last minute. I can't believe that this just was thought of in the, in the last week. Uh, and so, to me, the, the largest issue, and this extends past the city council, this extends to the county, to the school districts, school board. If anybody wants to pass any tax initiative or they want to present a tax initiative to the people of Oklahoma City, you must go through the Chamber of Commerce to run the campaign to do the TV ads and the polling, the polling that only they get to see, the public doesn't get to see, the polling, the radio ads, the, the, the whole campaign. What that does is it gives the Chamber of Commerce veto power over everything that is presented to the people of Oklahoma City. If the school board wants to run a bond, they have to stay on the good side of the Chamber of Commerce and they have to depend, they have to make sure that there are things in that bond that the Chamber is okay with or the Chamber will not run the campaign. If the county wants to address its jail or whatever it wants to do, same thing applies. And now you see, the, the one good thing about this is it's very transparent about how this really is an oligarchy that we live in. That, that the elected officials are not coming up with these ideas. Uh, and it is a third party. It is a relatively small number of people, I think, within that third party that are making these decisions. And it's too much power. They, that unelected body should not have veto power 
over everything that is presented to the people of Oklahoma City. And to me, this now becomes a referendum on the process, on the Chamber of Commerce's involvement. Other cities in America <laughs> do not do it this way. Other sit large cities in America do, are not completely reliant for every branch of government to go through the Chamber of Commerce to run their campaigns. It's just not how it's done. That's a unique, uh, that's unique to Oklahoma City. Maybe not completely unique, but it's, we're an outlier. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's acceptable. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, James? When I was, when I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot. My brain is tired and it hurts, but um, the, uh, I, I boiled it down to asking myself two questions. One question is, do I believe that we need to raise taxes uh, on people who buy things in Oklahoma City? And that's a, uh, it's, it, that is a yes and a no answer for me. The, the yes part is, yes, we do need to raise the permanent tax so we can properly fund um, police, fire, and other city, uh, city needs on a continual basis. And so that's where the quarter cent comes in. The, the second question is, do we need to raise the temporary tax or do we need to leave the temporary tax at a full penny? And my answer to that is no, because um, like, like Ed said, it is an arbitrary number. I don't think there's any sort of magic in the one full penny. Uh, if we did maps three right now with three quarters of a penny, it would be $600 million. And I still think that we can do transformative projects with that three quarters of a penny. And so for me, I, uh, the original plan, in, in my view, is, is the better plan because it doesn't raise the taxes of what, we've, what the citizens of Oklahoma City have been paying since 1993 any. Um, it does raise the permanent tax some, but the actual 8.375 doesn't change. And so um, that, that, those are just my, that, that's what I boiled it down to, and um, I'll, sw I'll quit talking. All right, Todd? I appreciate both of your comments. Um, for me personally, if we're gonna raise the quarter tax, let's call it a quarter tax raise. Let's not try to hide it necessarily behind shrinking the penny uh, temporary tax, the three quarter. So from that standpoint, you know I'm in full favor of the quarter penny. Um, in my opinion, what I'm tasked with is trying to present the best plan that we possibly can for our constituents to vote on. And I trust my constituents. I trust that they're going to look into whatever it is, the final proposition today. Uh, and I think they will do the right thing for them, and I trust that they'll make a wise decision in that. I think it's a good plan moving forward. I'm gonna support it. Uh, I tell you, out campaigning, there's, there's two things. It's public safety and it's streets. And in my opinion, these things both make a lot of headway in that area, so. But I do appreciate your comments. Thank you. and, and, I think, and I think both plans do that. The three quarters will, will do it. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a few brief comments as they pertain to Ward 3. The citizens of Ward 3 have been very vehement in their, and very consistent in their desire for two things. One, to improve the road conditions in Ward 3. And a considerable number of miles in Ward 3 are on the outlying area where artillery streets, arterial streets, except, excuse me, need either widening and, and fixing or just fixing or through resurfacing. The projects that are on the GO bond program go a, a long way towards leaving that, but they don't go far enough because of the need. And so by approving this plan, there will be additional monies available in the relative short term to expand some more roads uh, and to deal with that situation in Ward 3. The second thing in Ward 3 is a continuing effort to a desire for more police presence throughout the area. 
And as the population increases, the need for police in that area also increase, and the quarter cent sales tax dedicated to expanding police capability is definitely consistent with the desires of Ward 3 uh, residents as I interpret them. So therefore, I'm going to support the uh, plan also. Thank you, Your Honor. Going over process here. <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it seems complicated, it is. Uh, David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, well, first of all, it's, it's a, uh, this vote that we as a council take will provide for an election, and it's an election that will be decided upon the voters of Oklahoma City. So uh, that's all that we're doing is, pre is presenting an opportunity for the citizens of Oklahoma City, just like they did back in the early 90s, to assess themselves a quarter of a, pin, uh, a cent tax to improve the city services. Now, they've got a choice. They can decide yes or no. But all we're doing is providing an opportunity for them to uh, make that decision. Um, and I do think the way this is now structured, uh, it could be as transformational for the city as the MAPS program was in the early 90s. Uh, what are we asking for from the citizens? So when, the, when a citizen goes out and purchases $100 worth of groceries, if this tax passes, they'll pay $100 plus 25 cents a quarter. That's the amount of increase that we're talking about. For every $100 of expenditures, that amount will go up by 25 cents. So from my standpoint, uh, I think that's a doable request that we're making. And again, going back to comments I've made the past couple of years, I think the uh, level of dissatisfaction that is growing among the citizens of Oklahoma City towards public safety, but that's usually not that, uh, that is not voiced as much as the conditions of the roads. And uh, I asked City Manager uh, Couch to get an estimate from uh, Director of Public Services on what the cost would be just to bring the arterial streets up to, Jim, is it a PCI? Is that the term that we talk about? Yeah. <clears throat> to like an 80% level, and that was close to a billion dollars. Uh, so it's not science, Ed, but there's justification for that much to be allocated towards uh, streets uh, and roads. And that was an estimate that was provided a year ago. I don't think that number has gone down. I would suspect it's gone up since that time. And certainly, as we'll see uh, Councilman Stonecipher and McAtee on their proposals for the uh, commitment for public safety, this is going to give additional assurance to the public that their additional 25 cents for every $100 of expenditures will allow us to put additional police officers, additional firefighters, increase the number of fire stations out in our community. And it is something they want. So final statement, unlike we've seen the past couple of years at the state legislature, where the public has voiced uh, support for additional funding for education, additional funding for health care, additional funding for uh, public safety, and yet they've ignored it, not addressed it. We are at least addressing it and putting it before the public to let them make the final decision. That's all we're doing is asking for them to come to the polls in September, vote yes or no, and I think it's going to uh, be a successful vote. Thank you. Right. Meg? I think when you get this far down the horseshoe, it's hard to say a lot of new things, but I will try um, because I, I concur with most of the things that were said here today. So I might talk just a little bit about process. Um, we do have a process, I think, that works extremely well, and I want to give Councilman, uh, former Councilman Pat Ryan credit for it. We used to introduce these things and vote on them the same day they were introduced, and we don't do that anymore. We introduce something. Uh, at the following meeting, which is typically two weeks later, we have a public hearing. 
which we had last week, uh, and then, or two weeks ago, last week, <laughs> last week. Um, and then today, you know, we're in a place to take action. During the course of that process, we listen to citizens, and we frequently make changes to what's been introduced when we hear additional facts or when additional information comes to light. So I do think we've had process. I personally have had many citizens um, over the course of this discussion talk to me about the magic of maps. It, is, it has been the single star that has been transformational in this community over the last 25 years. And part of its magic is the penny, and part of the magic is its temporary nature. And so I think there is a lot of validity in maintaining that penny and allowing the citizens to vote on a regular basis whether or not we want to continue that penny tax. Um, to my mind, I've tried to look at how we raise revenue. I, I do believe our world has changed and that sales tax revenues will not rise back to the level that they were in the past. And as David said so well, the state has ignored raising revenue. Um, many of us uh, were supportive of the state looking at different ways to raise revenue. And, and I came to the realization myself that if I was encouraging the state to do that, and I recognized a need for extra police and fire, we probably ought to be courageous enough to talk about raising some permanent funding for police and fire as well. So that's, um, I think, where I am on this. And to go back to what I was saying earlier, I think we need to match revenue with what those expenditures represent. We can't expect to fund additional police and fire with temporary tax. I, I believe a permanent increase in uh, the number of personnel needs to be matched with permanent revenue sources. And then those things that we traditionally have funded through the penny, um, we identify projects. In this case, we've identified this concept of complete streets as our main focus. And that's a 27-month commitment by this resolution. At the end of 27 months, our citizens may say, we don't want to do that again. They may say, here's a, another list of projects that we think would be transformational for our community, and they have the opportunity to, to vote for that again. So I think this is an opportunity to match revenue with expenditures and the types of projects that fit them better. So in, in all of those instances, I am supportive of these proposals as they're laid out. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do believe this is, this is a step in uh, the right direction. Um, streets and public safety are the major issues that residents of Ward 7 are concerned about. And so again, I do believe this is a step in the right direction. Um, I do believe we need uh, to somehow figure out how can we get to that magic number uh, that the uh, FOP is requesting. Um, I do believe that we need to figure out a way how to get to that magic number that the uh, uh, fire department's requesting. And I, I, do we have to, I do believe that we have to figure something out long term as well as uh, short term. Um, I hope one day that we can get to where we don't have to take rigs uh, out of service. And I believe this is kind of the moving into uh, the right direction. I do want to, I do appreciate uh, Dr. Shadid bringing up the simple fact of education. Um, we need to do something with education. Uh, is it the city council's role uh, to get involved in education? Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and now, granted, we did Maps for Kids, and Maps for Kids was supposed to uh, transform uh, uh, the school system. It was supposed to transform uh, Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, we built nice buildings, but the needle for is offering quality education uh, at least in Northeast Oklahoma City, um, that never happened. Um, uh, uh, the school district never moved the needle. Uh, uh, and so I kind of have uh, mixed views for us for us education. I do believe we got to do something uh, uh, because we are le losing uh, teachers after teachers because the lack of um, pay. But is it the, the city's role to get involved in that? You know, I. Um, I, I, have, I have mixed uh, emotions. I do believe that is the responsibility of the school district in the state of Oklahoma. 
um, but what role the council, the city, we should play in that, I just, you know, I just don't know. I do believe we need uh, more uh, discussions uh, as, re as it relates to uh, education. But again, I do believe this is uh, the step in the uh, right direction. I've always been um, a neighborhood guy. Uh, I want to look out for the neighborhood, and I want to help the neighborhood, and I think that's what brought me here in the first place was I was the president of a homeowners association that had some issues and, and dealt with Pat Ryan on the city council to deal with the, those problems. Last night I was at the, the Red, o Red Oak Homeowners Association meeting and um, came together with all these people and they took me in their car and they drove me over to this creek where they're having this really serious erosion and drainage problems and they're worried about losing a house. And so we went back to, and we, we met outside, they have a community pool. We met outside there, we all sat down and we started talking about the problem that they were having and trying to figure out how to deal with it. Uh, but it all went back to, as it always does, because about every three or four weeks, we're all at an HOA meeting, it went back to the same thing. What are you gonna do about our roads? What are you gonna do about the police? And what are you gonna do about fire? And when we have articles that say, we are the 10, one, of the t one of the top 10 worst pothole cities in America. It's time we do something. Uh, and the, the one thing that I've learned through this process, and it's the first time I went through a geo bond process, is that we have to do that. It, it's, 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 it's necessary, it's mandatory. But it moves so slow. It takes so long through the geo bond process to get things done. And this is a unique opportunity. It is a wonderful opportunity for us to give something back to our, our residential neighborhoods. And I've heard it called maps for neighborhoods. I've heard it called road maps. I've heard it called maps for roads, community hand, enhancement, community revitalization. I don't care what you call it. This is a chance for us to do something that no other city in the United States is doing. Fix the roads quickly. Make our citizens happy. And, and I always hearken back to that Forbes article uh, that came out December 16th of last year, where it said the MAPS program is a model program and other cities should follow this. Uh, and, and, and that's what's great. And the, and, and the article pointed out there are other cities like Baltimore and Detroit and Kansas City that borrowed large sums of money and it didn't work out. This is an opportunity to let our voters decide on if they want to keep maps moving forward, if they want a new res, uh, renaissance for their neighborhoods, this is something for everybody. Not only will our downtown thrive through this, but our neighborhoods will thrive, and that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the deliberative process we've gone through up Good. here. I don't know that everybody, I don't know that anybody said the same thing, and I think it shows that, you know, this is a, this is a collection of, of philosophies, and I'm proud of the council for all the time they've spent on it. I know it has weighed upon each of you the last few weeks and months and, and days. We have one citizen who signed up to speak on education, and there's no real proper point to put that in there. I thought this might be the best place to plug it in. Um, Harriet uh, Porter. Good morning, Harriet. We will need your name and address for the yes. record, please. Harriet Porter, 624 Northwest 19th Street. Um, I certainly appreciate the comments of the whole council today. Uh, certainly our city's streets and roads have been in terrible shape for a long time, and, and I agree that we need to do something. But we had a large number of citizens here last week, and I think there are a large number of citizens out there who are very concerned about education. And at the time you had all the citizen uh, groups and the, and the polls and all of that getting people's interest was before the state legislature fell down on its job and didn't do anything to uh, improve the uh, financing for education. Over the last several years, five or six, I believe, every single year the appropriations for education have fallen. And I think we in the city are now at a crisis point that is new since we have had all of the parks and roads and the other things that are part of maps. I think this is an opportunity to jump in and, and plug the dike, um, really help our Oklahoma City schools survive. I personally think it probably would be better not in the permanent quarter percent, but in the three-year maps proposal to somehow have some of that money be designated to Oklahoma City schools to save the schools right this minute 
while we have three more years to go back to the legislature and say, you guys have got to step up to the plate and do something different. But I, I don't quite understand all of the, how the financing gets arranged and what if it's permanent and what if it's not. Um, but that would be my thought, to do something temporary right this minute, plug the dike, and then let the people go back and tell their state legislators this was not acceptable. But the Oklahoma City School District was in dire straits, and the city council uh, agreed to help out at this point. Thank you, Harriet. I know you speak for many. Appreciate it. Your Honor, may yes. I just make a comment? Sure. Uh, you know, last week I was unsure, and I've done research. Given the state's formula for providing aid to the local school district, which is designed to allow a very poor school district, say in southeastern Oklahoma, for students in those school districts to, in theory, have the same quality of education as a student in a more populous school district. The state developed a state aid funding formula. So the greater amount of local funding that a school district receives, traditionally in the form of property tax, ad valorem tax, the less amount of state aid that comes. So for example, uh, well, let me just make this statement. So any funding that the city of Oklahoma City provides to any school district, Oklahoma City or any of the suburban school district, increases local funding, which is going to lower the state funding. There's no ability to increase net funding of school districts unless we take over complete funding of a school district and rely uh, on no monies to, uh, from the, uh, the state. Currently, Oklahoma City Public Schools, and I failed to bring the documents with me, receives about 2400 I could be off $100 one way or the other, or $2,200 per pupil. Surprisingly, or maybe not, when you think about the amount of real estate in the surrounding school districts, uh, Moore School District receives more, Norman School District receives more state funding, uh, Midwest City, and I think it goes to show that the city of Oklahoma City and the Oklahoma City Public School District has a larger amount of real estate within it, even though the assessment ratio is pretty low, it's generating more revenue from the local community than these other surrounding school districts are. So state funding is greater for those surrounding school districts. Again, if we come in with any funding for their operations, not capital budget like Maps for Kids was, but operating funds, it's just going to drive down the amount of uh, funding that the state receives. There's about 30 school districts in the state of Oklahoma of the 500 that receive almost zero state aid. Certainly none of the districts in our area are in that uh, situation, but there are some school districts that uh, do not receive any state funds. We're not going to be able to increase net funding to any school district that uh, falls within the Oklahoma City, city limits. So I just wanted to communicate that and eliminate that uh, discussion as far as a possibility uh, of us being able to assist. Thank you. Yeah, James? I, I want to address the, the keeping the penny whole. Um, it's not about streets. That, that whole idea is not about streets. It's about the next idea. If we were wanting it to just be about streets, then what our, the amendment to our, the, the original idea would just been to extend it 12 months to 39 months instead of 27. So it's not about streets on keeping the penny whole. Those are two separate issues. Um, MAPS has been transformative. Nobody can argue with that. I, I, I tell people all the time, can you imagine the city without the arena? I can't. I mean, I, it, what, what the city would be like without it? I still contend that three-fourths of a penny can still generate transformative projects going forward. Um, if we raise it 0.25, if 
we raise our, our sales tax, our, our sales tax will be at 4.125. I looked up all the metro area yesterday. The only metro area that would be higher than us at that point, if I remember right, was would be Piedmont. They're, they're at 5%, which seems like they're trying to price themselves out of ever having any retail. But um, right now at 3.875, we are right in the middle. We're higher than more, but we're lower than Yukon. Uh, we're lower than um, Edmond. So for me, I still can't answer the question of should we raise the tax above what we're used to paying. Um, so there you go. All right. Are we I, ready to vote? Can I can I respond to David's? I mean, I yeah, sure. I, I think this is very dangerous what we're doing here today. And I've, I've said this for months. I think this may very well be the end of this form of sales tax extension. Um, because we're not listening to the people and we're not including things. Everybody has their anecdotal experience, right? You talk about public safety and roads, and I've heard that, but I've also heard people talk about education. And that we did a scientific poll and it showed that people want a diverse array of needs met, uh, not just roads. And you got all that you wanted. You got the 180 million you wanted for roads. And then we came up with another quarter penny and we still couldn't find a way to look into whether what you're saying, David, is right and look at education, which was number one on the chamber's poll. It was number one on the poll I commissioned. I mean, that's, those are highly likely voters in September. And that's what's showing up, number one, is education, finding a way to help the crisis in Oklahoma City schools and also public safety. Public, People should realize that this is, a, this is a halfway measure. Chief City has recommended 200 officers. We're getting half of that. And if we, if we wanted to address it, we should have just done a dedicated quarter for public safety. And then we should have done another quarter penny for operations. What the city needs is operations dollars. What the school districts needs is operations dollars. We have ways to get capital. We don't have ways to do operations. David, every day, every TIF district, Right? We have money, property tax, that we collect and then we give to Oklahoma City Schools and it doesn't count against their funding formula. The TIF money that we give them, 10 millions and millions and millions of dollars we're giving from our TIF districts to Oklahoma City Public Schools, it does not count against their state funding formula. And funds are, are fungible, as you know. You give some capital and then that frees up money for operations. But it's not affecting their their funding formula in any way, the TIF money that we're giving. It's, it's specifically excluded. It makes you almost want to put the whole downtown under a TIF and just give it to the schools. But be that as it may, I, I disagree with your contention. And I've studied it for months. And I have asked. Give me the if, statute, Ed, or give me the citation, because I've got four in-depth studies that show that. So. Give me, where am I, show, show me where I'm wrong. Show me the studies. I've, I mean, I'll, we've asked. As soon as this is over, I'll, I'll give them to you. Okay. Uh, may, may I also make a comment because I yes, am please. so stunned. I think I just heard it makes you want to put the whole downtown in a TIF. I'm joking. And for months, <laughs> the word I heard about TIF was diverting funds. Over and over again. Meg is Ed, very you sarcastic. Said our tips is a very, were diverting. Please don't funds. take that literally. That is very sarcastic. Okay. But the but the the money from TIFs goes to Oklahoma City Schools and is separate and distinct from the state funding formula. The state gives us the ability to give money to schools and it not count against the state funding formula. That's part of the TIF statute. That's correct. And, and I don't think but, the law is clear on that because I looked at, at the funding formula. I looked at the Grimes case. I looked at the Attorney General's case. And, and I heard from others that said that if we were going to receive more, that uh, school districts would probably get in litigation with us over it. And so I don't know. I, I, I want to help the teachers. I, I'm sorry the legislature did not. I want to do everything we can to, to get more money to our teachers. But what I don't want to do is head down a road where we end up in litigation the next three years on something we don't know if it's going to work or not work. But Ed, it's quite clear on local funding, this would be considered local funding. Any kind of monies that the city raises and contributes to their operating fund is local funding. I don't know how you can get away from that definition. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm not supportive of it. I think our system at the state level 
has a lot of flaws. Here's a great example of, of where it hurts a school district. I'm just saying these are the rules we have to work with. I, I think uh, we're entering a where everybody wants the last word. And, <laughs> and obviously, that's going to leave us here a very long time. So if it's OK, Mayor, I'd, I'd make a, a motion. motion. All right. We're uh, on, voting I, on item 9H. We have a, a motion. Is there a second? second? All right. Passes unanimously. Where are we? Item 9I would authorize the mayor to call for the special election on the quarter cent tax. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9J would call for the special election to be held September 12th for the quarter cent sales tax. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And item 9K would notify the county election board of the September 12th election date of the quarter cent sales tax. Is there a motion? Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, item 9L, and I'm waiting to see if, there, if there's a, an amendment that might be forthcoming. Yes, Your Honor, may I uh, present an amendment? I think I handed this out to everybody. Uh, it's a proposed amendment. Last time, uh, Larry and I submitted an amendment to the Exhibit A. Uh, we were trying to uh, give stronger language to Exhibit A to make sure that the money went to the first two prongs first, which would be lease and fire, instead of the money can be used, it shall be used. Uh, there was some concern raised on the horseshoe about this language and the timing and effect and impact it would have on, on uh, the, um, the funding of, of the third prong. And so I asked Jim Couch and I asked uh, Kenny Jordan to take a look at this. And as a result of that, um, there is a proposed amendment that's been handed out to you. And what it intends to do is it intends to make our police, our fire, feel comfortable uh, that this, this tax is going to be devoted to them as a priority. Uh, there also will be a third component. And uh, Kenny, if you could help me out a little bit and explain the amendments. Um, for example, it changes can be used to shall be used. Um, yes. Thank you. Sure. We worked with uh, the city manager's office and the finance director to put this together. And it does uh, change shall, it can to shall. So this, this is council's intent on how this money shall be used. And it prioritizes police and fire, as Councilman Stonecipher said. And then it provides that after the funding is designated for items one and two, which is police and fire, to use any additional revenues to also fund other city general services and also police and fire. So when you get into three, it can be for police and fire services, facilities and equipment and also general municipal services to address the needs of the city. Then it also provides a new number four that's anticipated that the implementation of the projects for police and fire will take approximately three years and that the city is going to uh, develop a funding plan that will be in a place to address those projects for police and fire before the services described in paragraph three would be proceed. I just want our citizens to know that we are putting a great emphasis uh, and are a great priority on police and fire. And I want future council members to know that that was the intent of what we were doing. And I also want to thank Larry for his suggestion on the third prong to uh, allow police and fire services and facilities and equipment be included in that third prong. John. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, would, I, would I, I do think it's important to remember that you know, lots, police and fire also depend much greatly on other services from our city. IT, you know, there's lots of support required for them to perform their jobs. And, and so I want to be sure through this that we recognize those ancillary services and that we're able to provide that as well. Yes. Thank you. And I think that's important. It is. All I right. I think it's window dressing. I think it's I think you're trying to give the, the public the impression that police and fire are comfortable. I don't think they are. Being uh, out on their own now is a tax increase. Uh, I don't um, think that it meets the needs that our police chief says that the city needs in terms of 200 officers. We don't have enough money for operations. It's kind of a halfway measure on public safety and then it's and then it squeezes the rest of the city. When we're talking about litigation, right, we have a park, a, a downtown park coming online, and we have a streetcar coming online with no operations dollars for it. 
And now we're, now we're starting to see the realization that we've been talking about. Well, we want to run the streetcar on Sundays with 10 minute frequencies and at night and all the kind of things that we don't do for our bus system, uh, which is primarily uh, lower income riders. You want to talk about a lawsuit and a, and a uh, that's coming. If you, try and, if you try and do that for relatively wealthy riders of the streetcar, and you don't do that for our bus system, uh, now, now you absolutely will have a, a lawsuit on that. And you've got to make sure that you have a way to pay for these MAPS-3 programs and, and the rest of the state's operations needs. And so uh, I, that's it. All right. Your Honor, for at this time, I'd move to adopt the proposed amendment to Exhibit A. Uh, which is set forth in the handout, and I'd ask that the handout be made a part of the record. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passes eight to one. And then item 9L1, the, 9L2, the resolution. Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, we're on to item 9M, and this is the capital sales tax selection. The first one's the amendment. All right. To increase. Mark, you want to introduce the amendment? Yes. Um, I'm sorry. I move to amend the uh, proposed tax rate in ordinance number 257051 which proposes a uh, city capital improvement sales tax for 27 months from three quarters percent to one percent. Um, there are a myriad of reasons, much of which we've discussed here today, uh, but uh, I think first and foremost that uh, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, improve our streets, our sidewalks, our trails, uh, which are vitally important to the citizens of Oklahoma. And um, this is a temporary tax that will help the city catch up on providing more complete and safer street networks. Uh, it'll give us additional money. It'll be a project that's funded, um, that's funded debt-free. Uh, debt and um, I, for those reasons, I would move for the amendment. Second. All right, we're voting on item 9M1. Cast your votes. Passes 7-2. Is there a motion on item 9M2? Cast your votes. Passes 7-2. Item 9 in 1 would authorize uh, the mayor to issue a proclamation calling for the special election for the 1%. Uh, I think we're, do, do we Hold first have? Michael, what? I said that was a public hearing. I said that my paperwork was speaking on it. When did you do that? All right, come on up, Michael. <laughs> Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast uh, 18th Street. Uh, let me, I'm a little bit unorganized. I had to fly back here from here, Oklahoma. Public hearing and action on proposed amendment to ordinance 10, uh, number 257751 to change the rate of the proposed city capital improvement sales tax from 3% to 1%. Councilman, okay. Well, number one. I do not believe that uh, this amendment should be made. I believe that, again, roads are very nice, parks are nice, uh, cracks in the roads are nice, but again, I still need some money in my community for my kids that don't have proper living and proper education. I do not believe that this sales tax is necessary to 1% because what's, for the most part, unless, I'll take that back, unless if I could personally manage and oversee the, the funds to be used, to distribute it, then maybe we can do that. But right now, I don't think it's necessary. Now, this, for the most part, is a design ordinance that is, again, I believe, earmarked. We say for streets and roads and all that, but I believe it's going in the pockets of the wealthy so they can have a $28 million clubhouse, you know, or a quality car, a trolley car, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so that's my problem with that. Now, 
If, in fact, this money could be used, I'm so tall, I can't really talk the way I want. If this money could actually be used for the purpose of actually addressing streets, and we had some outside influences that are geared toward protecting its, distri its distribution, then I believe that this money would be a good cause for this tax raise, or this from 3 to 4, 4 percent to 1%. But again, just by you saying that without putting it in place, I didn't hear anything in place, even before I got here listening, I didn't hear anything in place about how much it's going to go for this road. Who's going to get the money here? Is this going to the northwest or southwest side of roads? Okay, that seems to me to be blatantly obscure. And until we can get that proposal uh, more laid out with specifics, Michael Washington, one of the people who likes specifics, and when you say taxpayers' dollars, once again, I like always reminding this committee that I pay taxes. I buy hamburgers, cookies, potato chips, crackers, or whatever the case may be, and I have to add whatever 10% tax, especially on this little store on the northeast side, which I'm very frustrated with. So again, if in fact this money can be earmarked to actually be used for the pavements, roads construction, and I, as there's a lot of streets, oh my God, that needs definitely needs uh, repairing. But that's not, uh, matter of fact too, I just saw a couple of spots uh, close to where I live where the streets are finally, after 10 years, being touched up. And I said to myself, wow, let me take a picture and put it on Facebook because is this live or is this Memorex? Okay, so for something to have taken that long where I live this money and then just suddenly be spent, I'm telling you, there's something not right with this picture. And until it does, it needs to be excluded. Thank you very much for this time and patience. And like Arnold Schwarzenegger say, I'll be back. Thank you. All right, item nine end, and we will need the amendment. Yeah, we'll need an amendment oh, yeah. to that to change the three quarters percent to one percent. And I'd, I'd make that motion. Is there a second? All right, cast your votes on nine end. Passes seven two. Item nine. Oh, the or do we need to vote uh, we, the we resolution need, after the amendment? We need an amendment again. Yeah. I okay. moved to amend from three quarters percent to one percent on item nine O. All right. Cast your votes. Passes seven two. Item nine P. Three quarters percent sales tax to one percent. Cast your votes. Passes 7-2. And item 9-Q. I'd move item 9-Q. 9-Q, yes. 9-Q uh, from uh, three quarters of a percent to one percent. All right, cast your votes. Pa passes 8-1. Did I give the wrong one? Did we cover 9-P? 9-Q is just the intent of what we're using it for. But James, I think in the third paragraph it does specify does it, it as three quarters for post temporary sales tax. Well, I mean, I, I want to vote against the amendment, but vote for the intent. So I don't know how we do that. Um, I don't know that you can do that. I mean, I think, you have, I, I think the resolution is on the amount and the intent is just part of it. Is that right? Yes, the resolution of intent, the actual wording of that doesn't really change. It's all, all, all that uh, changes on that is uh, the amounts. It's the dollar amounts that would go toward those different. Yeah, parts. I know, and I, I want to vote against changing the amounts. Right. But for what we're using the amounts for. You know, I think by speaking <laughs> on it, you've done so. I think you've done a good job of communicating your, your feelings today. I don't think people will be confused about where you're coming from. but. I don't see a way to, act to, to do that structurally. Well, the city manager suggested perhaps we could vote on the amendment separately. Would that, would that satisfy what you want to do? Yes, you can make a motion to vote on the change the dollar amounts in the resolution of intent, Exhibit A, and vote on that separately. Okay. On just on Q? Yes. Okay. Change the percent. So this is the one you'd be against. All right, cast your votes. Passes 7-2. And then the uh, resolution on the intent. Second. Cast your votes, and it passes 8-1.
Brian. Now we're on item 9R of the council agenda. We have a few people that have signed up to speak. This is a public hearing today, and it uh, regards the reclamation of impended animals, the abandoned adoption, and some of our procedures. Uh, Mary Kramolowski. Thank you, Mary Kramolowski, 6101 Rambridge Drive. Um, I've been involved in cat rescue in Oklahoma City for the past 12 years. I fully support the Oklahoma City Animal Welfare's petition to eliminate the exception regarding the return of free roaming cats to their place of origin. Eliminating the current exception will result in more Oklahoma City community cats being sterilized. Numerous studies have found that managing community cat populations through catch and kill does not work. Unsterilized cats reproduce, uh, repopulate the area taking advantage of a food source and continue to reproduce. Returning sterilized cats to their area prevents other cats from moving in and ends the reproduction nightmare that is often the cause of nuisance situations. Right now our shelters and rescues are overrun with kittens. I received numerous calls, I got two this morning, <laughs> and contacts daily asking me to save these cats. All the rescues and shelters are full. Citizens are desperate for help. Studies have shown that community cats contribute about 80% of the kittens born each year and are the most significant source of cat overpopulation. The only way to curb what is known as kitten season and reduce the number of cats killed each year at the shelter is through spay and neuter. Some citizens are concerned that the returned cats will continue to be a nuisance, but we know neutering drastically reduces annoying behaviors like yowling, fighting, and spraying because testosterone levels are no longer present. Others are concerned about the cost. The communities with managed programs, long-term costs have proven to be less than the repeated cycle of trap, house, euthanize, and dispose of. Some may be concerned about municipal liability, but, TNR, but a TNR program is reasonable, responsible government behavior, not negligent conduct. Liability stems from ownership, but no one owns a community cat like no one owns a squirrel that causes damage. Additionally, vaccinated community cats reduce the risk of rabies transmission to citizens and other animals. Lastly, some are concerned about the dumping of unwanted, unsterilized cats at other at area lakes. This increase has never been documented in communities with active TNR programs, and it is unrealistic to think that less cats overall would result in more cats in any one area. Properly managed TNR programs do not create cat overpopulation because the cats are already there. This program will control and over time reduce the community cat population of Oklahoma City. Seven in 10 pet owners believe animal shelters should be allowed to euthanize animals only when they are too sick to be treated or too aggressive to be adopted, not as a population control measure. Please approve this proactive approach so that we can start to have a lasting impact on the community cats of Oklahoma City. Thank you. Claudia Ayers. Morning. Comfortable, they feel safe, they're fed, sheltered, and watered. Um, as different of cats that are homeless. I wrote this today because I'm not very good, good at standing in front of people. I, Claudia Ayers, was recruited 10 years ago by Christy Counts, founder of Oklahoma Humane Society herself. Due to a crazy lady that had been trapping all over Oklahoma City and bringing the cats to the lake of a holster at the boathouse, the areas were way out of control with cats. I went to a meeting at the Oklahoma City Shelter with Catherine English, Christy Counts, and Samantha Burnett. Many promises were made. We would be a part of a team with full support, help with food, trapping, many other volunteers to help, and they would take all the adoptable cats. All promises were short-lived. I see, I was terminated from the Oklahoma Humane Society after a disagreement over some kittens. You all have packets 
and that story in detail is in there. There's a picture of a cat. It's called the story of Slacker. If you will read that, you will understand. Christy Counts actually threatened to call the police on me. Um, I'm now back with them. Once they opened their first span neuter clinic, boy, they wanted me back. But it wasn't me they wanted. It was my numbers. In September 2014, I was approved for my own 501c3 nonprofit status to try to get help with food. And here we are today. I do not know of even one rescue that was aware of this cat ordinance being proposed. Most groups thought it was a rumor I had heard. I called the mayor's office. They gave me Tina's number and said, and he confirmed the ordinance was for real. I do not appreciate those of us doing this work for free and out of our own pockets and not, were not consulted for our input. If I was going to open a hamburger restaurant, I would not go to the holy computer and read about studies. I would go to an experienced and successful hamburger restaurant owner and ask for his advice. From this point forward, at times I will mention, this is not a four. Yes, sir. You have any closing Pardon? comments? I'll let you close your comments if you'd like, but you've exceeded the time allowed. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Oh, gosh, I have several pages. I'm, I'm but sure I will you do. Tell but you I... that this speech is all in your packets, mm -hmm. but um, this is it. Time's over. Okay, then let me read the last page to you. In closing, I plead with you to not buy into this. It's great for Oklahoma City campaign. I'm going to give you a quote from Helen Keller. Once wrote, the, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. I speak to you today from the heart. Unfortunately, I have also been able to see all the cruelty that the, these homeless animals face. And again, these are all listed in your packets. Thank you, Claudia. Please do not pass this inhumane ordinance to something so innocent and defenseless. That is from my minister, John Rogers. Thank Miller Pauline. Girardi. Thank you. In the matter of time, uh, my name is Miller Girardi. I live at 1809 Graham Circle, which is about two blocks directly east of the Overholzer Dam. My wife and I have lived there for about 52 years in the Bethany and Oklahoma City area both. I will just reiterate what these two ladies have said previously and not take your time, but this seems to be a recurring problem every spring because people seem to dump their animals around the lakes when they move or graduate or whatever, and they become a real problem for the residences in these areas. I sympathize with Miss Ayers. I have seen what she has done. She has helped us trap cats take care of them, and I have uh, helped her uh, haul multiple pallets of cat food to feed these cats, and she takes her time 24-7 to take care of these animals. And I don't think there's anybody that has more compassion for these animals than Miss Ayers does. And so I uh, thank you for your time, and I uh, hope that you will uh, vote to not return these animals to the areas because they're a very big problem for residences. Thank you. Thank you, Miller. Michael, Washington. This, sir. I have a petition of 310, signed petition of homeowners around Lake Oberholzer that wants the cat colony program at Lake Oberholzer in there. They're tired of it. Okay. Be, you're, you're welcome to deliver that list of petition. Michael, okay. you want to speak? Yeah. 
I'll pass this, Mayor. I thought this was regarding the uh, vicious uh, attack on, on Ms. Short. May she rest in peace. Okay. I was just going to support it. Thank you. That's all this was. All right. All right. This concludes the public hearing. We would expect a final vote on that item to be on July 5th. Your Honor, may I yes. ask Bob a question concerning this? Uh, I had a letter from a, a resident of Ward 5, and she has in the past collected uh, more than one cat uh, that was loose in her neighborhood and took it to the animal shelter. And they said, or they asked her if she wanted the cat returned after they sprayed or neutered the cat, and she requested that it not. If an individual uh, captures a, uh, a cat and takes it to the animal shelter, could we provide a provision if they request that the animal not be returned to their neighborhood, could we have an exclusion to this process in those cases? Not, they're not volunteers. They just have an animal that's been creating a problem in their house, around their house, and so they've captured it themselves, taken it to the animal shelter, and they've requested that the animal not be returned to the neighborhood. That's, that's how the ordinance is currently. Yeah. Uh, if somebody asks that it not be returned, we don't return it. We try to put it into another a barn program or something else. Right. So this amendment is trying to uh, allow us. There's a there's a series of conditions that an animal a cat would not be returned. Okay. But what we're trying to do in this ordinance is to allow us to return them to the area in uh, yeah. of origin, which would be within a mile radius. Okay. And to give us, give us an opportunity to see if that's going to work and help our numbers in, in the spade and neuter program. Okay, but do you understand the distinction? In this case, it was just a homeowner who captured the animal themselves and brought it to the animal right. shelter. Well, let me ask you this then. Could you, when you returned it, return it as far, as what, as far away from that particular homeowner as possible? <laughs> within that mile radius? Yes, we could do that. Uh, one thing, another thing, if an owner brings us a cat and they feel that that cat is at risk of abuse or any other situation, we won't return the cat there. Okay. So, okay. I mean, I that's I think that was the assurance. critical component of that. Yeah. You're not forcing a cat to go back to where the homeowner right. but just, just took it into the animal shelter and it just yeah, keeps we, coming back. We need that owner to tell us that this cat's at risk and then we won't okay. put it back. But if it's just a a community cat sometimes is already is an owned cat, but mm -hmm. you know it's it, the owner doesn't know it's gone. Yeah. And so if we spay, neuter, bring it back, then it'll go back to the the owner. Yeah. Thank you. I was just trying to voice her concern. Yeah. yeah okay. As the ordinance says right now, it actually has two. It says that um, they won't be returned if the citizen complaining about the cat doesn't want it returned, or if the person bringing in the cat doesn't want it returned. And so I've asked Kenny to make an amendment to leave that exception in, but take out the exception of just the citizen complaining. Because yeah, yeah. I think if somebody's just calling in yeah. complaining yeah. about a cat, then that's probably not. Yes. I mean, but if somebody's taking the time, energy, money to actually capture the cat and bring it in and they don't want it back, I still feel like they should have a say in it. So I've asked Kenny to add, add an amendment to that for next, next week Thank or you, two Kenny. weeks ago. Yeah. Yes. All right, we're on to item 9S. This is change the uh, comprehensive plan. And uh, Mike Aubrey's here. Okay. This change would happen in Ward 3. Good morning, Council and Mayor. Uh, we actually have three items on the agenda under item S, items 1, 2, and 3, and I'd like to present them together if I may. Um, this first slide shows the locations of all of these comprehensive plan amendments. These would be changes to our comprehensive plan map that have been approved by Planning Commission. I'd like to walk you through each of them. So item number one is Ward 3. It's an area north of Northwest 23rd Street between North Richland Road and North Frisco Road. Um, area two on the map is in Ward 1. It's southeast of Northwest 50th and the Kilpatrick Turnpike. 
and area or item three is Ward 4, northwest of Southeast 74th and South Sooner Road. The first one, go to the next slide, is uh, here northwest of Northwest 23rd Street. And the next slide shows an aerial of the location. You might recognize this location as being uh, an area that we previously annexed a portion of it to the city of Yukon. And then we came back and annexed the portion to the north of I-40 back into Oklahoma City. The developer owns this property on both sides of the interstate and wants to develop a small regional entertainment district, including an indoor water park on the site. So the city re-annexed what's called Area 2 north of I-40 back in. So where there are two actions that Planning Commission had taken. One was to assign a land use typology area to the area that we annexed back into the city. And the other was to change the land use typology in the area south of I-40. So this is about 210 undeveloped acres and there's an accompanying PUD document that creates a regional entertainment district to do commercial, retail, hotel uses. The next slide shows the comprehensive plan map in those two areas. And the map shows the polka dotted hatch in, over area one. That is called urban reserve in the comprehensive plan. And what urban reserve means is that that area does not have full city services at this time, but it is expected eventually to gain those services. So if you go to the next map, um, slide, what this explains is that these undeveloped parcels, when they are ready to urbanize, that urban reserve layer may be lifted off of the map so that it can be developed as urban low intensity. And you'll see urban low intensity several times for all three of these comp plan amendments because all three are changing to urban low intensity. So this is parts of Oklahoma City that receives city water, sewer, police, fire services. Through uh, an arrangement with the city of Yukon, the city of Yukon has agreed to provide those services to these parcels of land. So it kind of creates an isolated node of regional entertainment serviceable land because this area is eventually gonna have an interchange from I-40 and Frisco Road. That is an ODOT's eight year plan. The next slide explains what planning commission considers when changing an area to urban low intensity. So you see the range of services, water, sewer, fire, and then I have a little stoplight map that shows whether or not they pass the test on those things. So you can see the green light on water and sewer through the agreement with the city of Yukon. Fire service is in the yellow range, meaning that it's longer response times than preferred, but there could be en enhanced agreements with the city of Yukon to increase the fire response to this area. Compatibility is another consideration, looking at whether or not um, uh, the area is consistent with or connected to other uh, places in Oklahoma City that are considered urban, and that passes the test for a highway corridor with a highway interchange being urbanized. The transportation network, getting to and from this site, the roads that access this may need improvements. We see this as something that happens long down the road after that interchange is in place. And then whether or not it's contiguous to other areas. And as I said before, this kind of creates a new node that is not inconsistent with the comprehensive plan along a major highway corridor with a major intersection. So Planning Commission felt this was appropriate to designate as urban low intensity. The next one on your agenda, item number two, is at Northwest 50th and Kilpatrick. You just reviewed this this morning, the PUD. And the next slide shows the aerial of the location. So you can see that this is a 34-acre site, uh, PUD 1641, which was presented this morning. And this is uh, to develop some commercial uses just north of an existing or a planned commercial development along that corridor at Kilpatrick. So the land use designation in the next slide shows that this area is designated as what is called agricultural preserve. And the slide after that will show you that agricultural preserve is originally designated because we have large areas of land in Oklahoma City that are primarily agricultural. The zoning of this land was double A. Many of these agricultural preserve areas are really conducive to agricultural uses because they're in a floodplain, as was this site. This site was also designated as rural low intensity. It had not previously been platted and was used for large, it was a very large undivided parcel. However, the development pattern in this area along Kilpatrick Turnpike is commercial in nature, and this site would be required to connect to city water and sewer because it's within a quarter mile of those services. So the next slide shows the checklist of things that Planning Commission considers. Water and sewer are available and will be connected. Fire was another one of those, longer response time than preferred. 
the applicant, when they presented to Planning Commission, said that um, the fire response they drove was within the preferred response time. Um, compatibility, this is something that uh, has to be weighed in terms of the benefit of the development to the intent of the comprehensive plan. The intent of the comprehensive plan is not to develop within the floodplain. However, this entire site is within the floodplain. So the portion of it that fronts Kilpatrick Turnpike will be designed to meet the drainage code, will be designed to continue the commercial development on the edge of that um, parcel next to the uh, turnpike. Transportation system as well, this is another one of those considerations where road improvements may be necessary to the surrounding streets. The applicant presented a, a transportation arrangement to where they would not need to take access from some of the unimproved roads to be able to get to this development. And uh, it is contig contiguous with other urban areas. And then the final comprehensive plan amendment is on the south side. This will be in um, Ward 4, and it's at S Southeast 17th Street and Sooner Road. The aerial map next shows that this is an 80 acre undeveloped site. This is also coming to the city with an accompanying planned unit development, PUD 1643. The intent of that is to rezone an I-2 industrial area in order to develop multifamily residential. So the comprehensive plan map, if you go to the next slide, shows that this area is in the middle of what's designated as heavy industrial in the comprehensive plan. And the next slide will show you that the heavy industrial area is designated as such because it concentrates intense industrial uses together that may pose negative impacts to adjacent lower intensity types of development. It tries to preserve land that has attributes such as the proximity to highway corridors and rail access. The applicant came in with a proposal to develop multifamily here and the, um, the services are available. Multi, uh, urban low intensity will accommodate multifamily in this area. One of the considerations was that this parcel has never been developed for industrial uses because it requires a long bridge over a creek that is very cost prohibitive for the type of industrial development that they think the site could accommodate. The next slide shows you the checklist of considerations and that it meets almost all of the conditions for urban low intensity. One of the issues that was raised was compatibility. What happens when you allow multifamily development next to heavy industrial development? The proposed PUD outlines different types of mitigation measures through design to uh, try to soften that impact between residential and industrial uses. Um, and then on the matter of it being contiguous to the other uh, urban low, Planning Commission felt that in a subsequent application that we should come back and expand the urban low area to the east and to the south so that we make a clean cut between urban low and industrial. So that will be a second uh, plan amendment that will come at a later date. So of all three of these proposals, Planning Commission unanimously passed them on the date shown on the screen and the action that we're presenting to you today is to receive these amendments to the comp plan. I'll breathe this, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, the third one, um, S3, looks like it's right next door to a sand mining operation. Yes. Or, and uh, I mean, you've somewhat addressed this, but if you put residential next door to that, um, what impact does that have on the existing business if people you know, begin to complain or? Um, I know that the applicant is here, uh, could probably speak to some of those mitigation measures that they proposed in their PUD, if that would be okay. With great, you. that'd be great, thank you. Sorry to meddle. <laughs> All right, thanks, Aubrey. We have three items that follow Aubrey's presentation. Number two and three have presentations coming with them, but I don't believe number one does. So is there a motion on item 9S1? Is there a second? second? All right, cast your votes. It passes eight to one. And item 9S2, uh, Eric Groves is asked to speak. Eric? We really don't have much to say, except we would appreciate it if you would receive the amendment, All right. which was approved by the Planning Commission. Is there a motion on 9S2? Second. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And uh, David Box is ready to speak on 9S3. Good morning, David Box, 522 Call Core Drive. Um, <clears throat> great question, and that was a question raised by Planning Commission. If you look at our site, it's this 80-acre tract that's undeveloped here. And so what we have is some significant limitations. Although it's 80 acres, 30 of it or more are in the floodway. 
And so my, my client, Mr. Tannenbaum, in an effort to stay out of that, is only developing the portion that is west of that creek and floodway. What that means is we have a significant cost to get to the developable portion. So that's a bridge. That is one of the reasons why it didn't lend itself to industrial. But to your specific question on how to address mitigation measures, what we have done in the, in the PUD is we have setbacks, berms, and we have some natural tree cover that will continue to exist. Uh, it was an item that we discussed for, for quite some time uh, and, and ultimately was unanimously approved by the planning because they felt after we got done that there just wasn't long-term viability for this to ever be developed as industrial. But what we have is a significant demand for nice apartments in this area because of Tinker and all, Boeing and all the other um, users out there where you might have contract employees that are here for three to five years where they don't want to buy a home but they want to live in something very nice in close proximity to where they work. And so well, all those factors are what led Planning Commission to ultimately uh, unanimously recommend approval, or not recommend, they actually approve uh, the comp plan amendments. All right, thanks, David. Is Thank there you. a motion on 9A3? 9S3. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9T, understand we do need executive session on this item? We do. All right, is there a motion to move item 9T to executive session? All right, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Item 9U is claims recommended for denial. He's here. All right, Sean Gilmore. Good morning, Council. Good morning, Sean. We'll Hi. need your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Sean Gilmore. I live at 11809 Glenhurst Boulevard in Oklahoma City. All right. Tell us about the claim you've made against the city. Uh, well, uh, there was um, a large storm at the end of April uh, at a rental property, a rental house that I own at 4016 Northwest 13th Street. And um, it's right next to a city park. And there's a large tree in the city park that's real close to my house uh, that um, toppled over and hit the back of my house that caused some damage and um, I feel like the city should should pay for the damage because the the tree was so large and it was leaning towards my house and it probably should have been taken care of before the tree toppled over okay. um, and I, I just think it's the neighborly thing to do to to to, to take care of the neighbor that the, the damage was caused to let me get some legal advice Tina can you shed some light on our options here uh, yes, sir. The uh, the tree fell over in a rather large storm, so there was the uh, the act of God kind of uh, overlay to this. But probably one of the things that led most directly to our recommending denial was the fact that the Parks Department just did a huge survey of all trees on all their property. This tree was also uh, talked about in that. Let's see. This survey conducted by an independent expert showed that the tree that fell onto his house was deemed at that time to be healthy and in no need of immediate maintenance. So we had checked the trees. Right. That tree was represented to us as being in no danger of having any damage. Okay. And uh, that's... Well, I guess I'm just asking, I mean, if it's our tree, are we responsible what happens to that tree, just the same way a, a, a private citizen would, or is it different because of our standing as a municipality? We do have some additional coverage in the Governmental Tort Claims Act for some things that are act of God kinds of things that a right. private property owner would not have. Well, does this sound like something that the council has discretion on, Kenny, or would, would state law prohibit us from paying this claim? I think state law prohibits you from paying the claim. Because of what she just mentioned? Though. Right. Okay. All right. Well. Sean, I wish we had better news for you, okay. but um, it sounds like we would violate state law if we if we paid the claim. So we're stuck by that. You can go across the street to district court and file your claim there, and some have done that, and, and some have, have turned out better. But I really appreciate you coming all the way down here, and I'm sorry we don't have better news and, and the, the ability to pay, and I hope okay. your house is in better shape. Appreciate it. All Thanks right. for listening okay. to me. Huh. All right, is there a motion then on 9U? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Let me go back to F. How about this? Yes. I will. All right. And we have claims recommended for approval. Is there a motion? Second. All right. Cast your votes. 
passed unanimously. And the clerk has informed me that on a previous item, we neglected to add the emergency. So item 9F needs the emergency clause. Can we? And it's on the GO bonds. Yeah. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. All right, items from council. And uh, Councilman Stonecipher, Councilman McAtee, and Councilman Pettis have introduced an ordinance in today's opportunity for a public hearing. Is there anyone signed up to speak here on Yes, there's a few people that have signed up to speak. Um, Lisa Carlisle. And I would tell you that Mrs. Short's daughters are here today, and, and this is one of the daughters, and we're happy to have her. Lisa Carlisle, 11017 Chancellor Court. And I just think that any move forward with ordinances, possibly homeowners insurance increases, depending on how dangerous and menacing these dogs are, anything is better than what we have right now. Um, I know that this didn't have to happen, it shouldn't have happened. Um, the day it did happen, as I waited to get to my mother's house behind the police lines, I decided to kind of take a walk and just talk to people. Within 10 minutes, I found out where this gentleman lived. I found out he owned those dogs, and they were willing to give me his numbers, everything. And that was in less than 10 minutes. There has to be something done, some follow-up. These dogs have been the issue. You know, if I'm horrified it was my mother, but as you probably read and seen, there's been children attacked on the way to the bus. There's been numerous occasions where there could have been something done and nothing was done. And um, any move forward, that is allowed and put on is one step further than we are now, you know, in a prevention of loss of life, permanent disfigurement, you know, all sorts of handicaps that animals with this kind of propensity can cause. And I thank you for letting me share. I'm sorry for your loss, Lisa. Melinda Clouts. Melinda Klont, 6508 South Sycamore Avenue, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Um, I'm Cecile's other daughter. Um, we never intended to get the knowledge we've gotten through this kind of a situation. This tragedy happens and we stopped and did not know where to turn. And I, I know you are citizens as well as public servants. And I want to take the moment to say thank you because we didn't know how to get from step A to step B. And Councilman Stonecipher and Pettis and McAtee actually took steps that we weren't even aware of to try to mitigate this situation for future residents. So I want to ask you to support this, this ordinance. I think it goes in the right direction. And as my sister voiced, um, as you all have been talking, I've been educated on the processes. As I said, this is something we've never experienced as just citizens but watching how the process works. And I've noticed that you're talking about these tax issues that keep saying these are steps in the right direction. And I want to reiterate what she said. This is, I believe, awesome first steps in the right direction, but there needs to be even stronger impetuses put it in place to keep these owners that are not responsible, make them toe the line, make it hurt them financially, make it hurt them in other ways so that they think twice about letting animals that they know are menacing, that they know are a danger to citizens in their community, make it hurt them enough that they do not keep those animals in community areas. I thank you so much for your time, and I thank you for all this gone, the work that's gone into this. Thank you, Melinda. Um, Francois? Um, 
My name is Francoise Bigot. I uh, live at 2812 Northwest 19th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a street with a grass and tree median where everybody walks their little dog or their big dog. Uh, last year, I had my little dog, little dog killed when I saw the dogs uh, coming out of the bushes. I knew they were dangerous dogs. I had seen them before with their owner. I pulled my little dog up. Uh, she was halfway, the dog got to her. Uh, she was, as you can guess, torn to pieces and she died. Uh, the only way I, it did not get worse, one was a pit bull, the other one was another dog. Uh, the only way it did not get worse, I knew, was just to stand there, not move, otherwise they would go after me as well. That's absolutely a horrible thought at the time, and uh, even now I can relive. It's all right. Take your time. What you do and what I hope you're going to do is uh, what the two ladies before have suggested. I would like to see a public registry for dangerous dogs with pictures and some identification. Uh, so anybody seeing a dog or um, whether they're on a leash, but it's sometimes easy to uh, see a dog is dangerous. They don't like other animals, they don't like people, they bark and they want to get to them, even when they're on a leash with the owner. If there was a registry with pictures and some other uh, way of uh, identifying them, uh, people could be more aware. The other thing that I would like to see is a bond or insurance for registered dangerous dogs. That uh, would, um, I think, slow down the, the number of uh, people who have no hesitation about adopting dogs uh, who really should not be adopted or breeding them who should not be bred. The other thing that I would like to see is the uh, payment of penalties uh, should be more very substantial to discourage irresponsible owners of dogs. I found um, that a lot of uh, dangerous dogs are owned not only by homeowners, but also landlords, uh, um, tenants. And I found that uh, quite a lot of uh, landlords do not care what kind of dogs come into their property. I do not know how that can be avoided, uh, but that is a big problem in the neighborhood where I am. Uh, I am a landlord myself. I am very careful as to what size, what kind of dog the tenant can have. And somehow the uh, landlords should also be held responsible in some kind of way if they accept dogs that are on the reg registry that I would like to see, and do not maintain their property and especially the, uh, the yards uh, in such a way that if the dogs are outside in the yards, they will get out of it. So I will welcome anything you're going to do. It will be much better than what has been done so far, and I hope you will even go beyond what you're thinking of doing. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating. Uh, Emily? I don't know my middle name, oh. so I'm going to say... Lita. Yes. My name is Lita Hedgelon. I live on Northwest 86th Street, just north of Hefner Middle School. We moved to that house in 1981. At that time, the backyard fence was already old and failing. We had the lot surveyed by E.D. Hill and in 1992 installed entirely with our, within our boundaries of our property a cedar fence extending from the gate on the west side around the backyard to the gate on the east side. That fence still stands but has weakened with age. The neighbors to the north 
east half of the lot on 87th Street keep large dogs that appear to be pit bulls. The dogs are at times aggressive, barking and growling. We contacted the neighbor and asked if he would walk the dogs around the block, bring them to our backyard, and let the dogs get to know us. That was rejected. Last year, we discovered five dogs in our backyard. One looked like a coyote mix, and the others were larger. My husband was able to chase them back under our fence, and he, he then blocked the hole that was dug with, a, with cinder blocks and screening. This year, the new neighbors to the northwest half of the lot moved in with at least three dogs. One of those dogs was distressed, howling, and crying through the night for several days. We made no complaint to the new neighbor, and the, new, and the dog settled down after a week or 10 days. Ex extending a greeting over the back fence, we were told that there were three dogs, a rescue dog and two pit bulls, of which one was a trained attack dog. These dogs attacked our front fence, which was the only thing restraining them, breaking through. We called the neighbor who called the dogs back. Apparently attempting to keep the dogs confined, the neighbor drove nails, not screws, to attach lumber to our fence. Later, we tried to arrange a meeting to arrange for repairs to our fence. Having the dogs confined so the worker does not get mauled, we were told that they had to work and had no time to discuss this with us. Those dogs again broke through the fence, romping around our backyard, exploring the property, evacuating their waste, mar marking their domain, and breaking out into the property of a neighbor to the east. We were trapped in our own home. We called the animal control, no response. Asked to speak with a supervisor who called back later and indicated short staffing would delay a response. When the animal control officer did appear, the dogs had gone home. We had photos taken with a digital camera. The dog-owning neighbors have each suggested that not only is the cost of repairing the fence entirely our burden, but it is our fault for not building a fence sufficient to confine their dogs. We have never owned any pets since living in Oklahoma City. As for calling animal control, we were told by the responding officer that they were that <clears throat> We were one of four calls regarding these dogs in this instance. The dogs apparently getting out through our side of the fence or separately through the fence of the neighbor to the west. Citations were issued. Both dog-owning neighbors have expressed their view that we are obliged to replace our cedar privacy fence with a chain link fence to contain their dogs. This hearing is about effective remedies. The ordinance might be amended to require owners of a dog that is aggressive towards human beings be fined if they have failed to install and maintain tethers or containment structures on their own property from which the animal has escaped. The entire risk should be on those who chose to maintain a potential menace. Their responsibility is not met by a fence designed and maintained by someone else. Cecilia, Cecilia Short was the sorority sister of mine with whom I had contact on April 3rd. She was lethally mauled on April 6th. I am shocked and dismayed by her fate and in fear for my own today. I also fear for the children attending Hefner Middle School or any school who may turn and run becoming prey. I trust that you share my concern. I've read the ordinance. I wholly support it. Thank you for your attention. Please ask me any questions that you may have about the statement respectfully submitted June 20th, 2017. And I have pictures. All right. And may I give? Absolutely. Mead Hedgelong. The 
is a terribly difficult problem from a political point of view. The only tool you have is an ordinance. The ordinance speaks after the fact a violation. You can't go in and make everybody do everything beforehand. But the idea that somebody can have a dog and have no responsibility for it, give it no care, leave it outside all day long, and rely on other people's fences to keep the dog from running wild is ludicrous. The burden should be heavy enough that if your dog gets out, and I don't care if it's a big dog or a little dog, just as if you're out in a rural area and your cows get out on the highway, you're responsible if somebody hits them, if they're not responsible separately. And the point that I'm trying to get at is the price of letting your dog run loose should be not less than the cost of paying somebody that knows how to do it to build an enclosure or establish a tether system. That's why this ordinance is important. Now, the other thought that I'd like to leave with you is this. <clears throat> Big dogs, little dogs. We have sidewalks now in some parts of the city. They sometimes they're quite close to the curb. I'm walking along MacArthur, and I almost get hit by a car that's dodging a little dog that's running out in the street. The car didn't hit me or the dog. The dog, <laughs> the dog got away. The point is that dogs who are left outside by their owners all day long are not loved by the owners. That's not good care for your own animals. I don't have animals because I'm not willing to give them the kind of care that is required uh, just on a moral basis. I've said all I know. It's good to be here. I appreciate your patience. All right. Thank you, Mead. I want to express my appreciation to the three council members who've come forward with this ordinance and inspired these people to come down and speak in favor of it today. You three have anything to say or anybody else? All right, Michael, come talk. Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast 18th Street. First of all, I want to express my sincere, heartfelt condolences to the family of this lady who was viciously mauled by these animals. And I hope from and pray that they will have some kind of pleasure in that you can reorganize this ordinance that is to be submitted by these three gentlemen. I want to thank you all for that as well. This lady legally walking the street with her own dog, legally a dog to have, in a residential neighborhood, she wasn't expecting to be mauled to death. She wasn't expecting for some vicious dogs to come running at her and, and, and her life was over with. I would have been very frightened myself had that happened to me. And I have, in fact, seen where families have been mauled by vicious, uncontained, uncontrolled dogs. As a matter of fact, if I could suggest, I would like for this ordinance to re be renamed Mr. Cecilia Short in that recognition for this horrible thing that happened as a reminder to a family that this is something that will help their memory live. April 6th was a day that I was with my grandbabies in the house watching television. And when this tragic situation came over there, my heart was stopped. And I said to myself, oh my God, just walking in the, down the street, and here's a, a big, mean, vicious dog mauling this precious lady to death. Now she's no longer with the children. Children can no longer sit with her, sleep with her, you know, eat with her. And you better believe I'm in support of this organs. And I'm just want to wrap this up by saying, whatever I can do, to get this thing passed. I know it's not much, but I just want the family to know that in Michael Washington, you do have a friend if I can help you in some kind of way. And I don't know you, but thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you all for that. All right, and this item will also be back up for a final vote on, December, on uh, July 5th. All right, items from council continuing. Mark, anything the, else? The only thing, and I said it last time, uh, I want to thank uh, Bob Tiener, John Gray, um, Kenny and his staff, Cindy, Rita, Orville, did I forget anybody? There were a lot of people that worked on this ordinance and, and I, I think it's, it's a good work product and I think we all should be proud of it. All right, John, Meg? Mayor, just a quick thing. I, a couple of us, I think, received an email uh, in the last day or two from a citizen. We get emails all the time with suggestions and ideas and things that we might do, but this one I particularly liked. Um, it talks about a number of issues that we're working on transit and sidewalks and but one of the things it talked about was lighting and you know with regard to turning on lights throughout downtown he specifically references 
how dark it is downtown um, and not quite as welcoming. And he also references lighting our skyscrapers. And you know, as we travel around the world uh, and the country, so many cities have adopted policies, whether it's through, I don't know what, some kind of a subsidy, or just encouraging private property owners to use neon or use colored LED lights to light up their downtown. Tulsa's done a really good job with that, and I just want to mention it as an option. And you know, all the urban planning things I've been to, they talk about different sources of lighting and how ambient lighting can really change the way people feel. And um, so I just I thought it was a great idea. I wanted to mention it. All right, David. Todd. I just wanted to mention uh, last Friday I had the opportunity or honor really of attending the police cadet. Uh, graduation out at Metro. Uh, Councilman Pettis was there as well. And a uh, great time, just, just a great program. So thank you, Mayor. Larry? Just like to welcome Cecile's uh, children. I don't know if you remember or not, we used to fellowship with your mom and dad. Uh, their dad was one of the greatest athletes ever to come out of the state of Oklahoma. Arnold Short, a fine gentleman. His wife also was. And, uh, hopefully we'll get some positive Good out of all this. Thank you, yeah, Your Honor. I, I remember introducing both of them at the Oklahoma Sports Hall of Fame in, induction banquet. Yeah, Ed. Uh, so obviously things didn't turn out the way I wanted, but I, I just want to say I thought we had good discussion, and I really want to thank you for facilitating dissent. Uh, I know that some things we I say may will give you heartburn, but and you could say that you have the votes, but I think in talking to several people with decades of institutional memory. Not all mayors, even when they had all the votes, allowed dissent. You have to have a certain level of self-esteem and believe in, in diversity of opinions, benefits to do that. And I'm very grateful. Well, so, appreciate that, Ed. Yeah. James? All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we? City manager reports. In your packet is the uh, June uh, sales and use tax collection. And it, it's one of the better months we've had lately. It was 4.3% it was, uh, uh, over projection. So that's hopefully. You know, one month doesn't a trend start, but if you're going to have a, a trend start, it's got to start somewhere. So hope, hopefully this is it. That's great. All right. Citizens to be heard. Michael Washington. It's gone. Okay. Uh, Russell Fox. Good morning, and thank you. My name is Russell Fox. I live at 1514 Northwest 17th Street in Oklahoma City. And uh, I've really appreciated watching the quality of the deliberations today and appreciate uh, all the great things that uh, Your Honor, Mayor and Council uh, have done and do, do for this city. Um, I am here today to, um, and I'm not rep representing only myself as a private citizen, not any organization, but it was brought to my attention and I want to bring to your attention the um, existence of the Mayor's National Climate Action Agenda. Um, I think we're all quite familiar that uh, the president of this country has uh, caused this country to join the uh, nations of Syria and Honduras in withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords. Um, where the nation does not take leadership, then states, regions, and cities must take leadership in combating the disastrous um, uh, results of uh, greenhouse gases and climate change. And um, there is uh, an initiative afoot. I can distribute some information. What I'm passing around is a, uh, a proposed sample initiative uh, for council to consider um, in support as a city of the, of the Paris Agreement. And um, uh, your honor, I am in great appreciation of the great directions that your leadership has taken um, this city. And uh, I am here today to express the hope that you will consider adding your voice, especially in your leadership of the uh, American Council of Mayors, if I have the name of the organization correctly, um, in joining 300, the mayors of 323 other cities representing 64 million Americans in adding your voice and setting a direction for Oklahoma City to be partners on a city level to um, counteract and work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and uh, fight climate change. And I would like uh, 
Um, this is uh, from uh, the organization, climatemayors.org. I adapted it as a, as a possible wording of a, of a resolution for council um, to consider in favor of Oklahoma City as a city standing behind and joining behind the, the guidelines of the Paris, uh, Cl International Paris Climate Agreements. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. All right, we have executive session. We'll be back.